Chapter eight. I walked for two days straight without sleeping. I stopped only at streams to drink water. I felt as if somebody was after me. Often, my shadow would scare me and cause me to run for miles. Everything felt brutally awkward. Even the air seemed to want to attack me and break my neck. I knew I was hungry, but I didn't have the appetite to eat or to the strength to find food. I had passed through burnt villages where dead bodies of men, women, and children of all ages were scattered like leaves on the ground after a storm. Their eyes still showed fear, as if death hadn't freed them from the madness that continued to unfold. I had seen heads cut off by machetes, smashed by cement bricks, and rivers filled with so much blood that the water had ceased flowing. Each time my mind replayed these scenes, I increased my pace. Sometimes I closed my eyes hard to avoid thinking, but the eye of my mind refused to be closed and continued to plague me with images. My body twitched with fear and I became dizzy. I could see the leaves on the trees swaying, but I couldn't feel the wind. On the third day, I found myself in the middle of a thick forest standing beneath huge trees whose leaves and branches made it difficult to see the sky. I didn't remember how I had gotten there. Night was approaching, so I found a suitable tree that wasn't too high to climb. It had weaved branches from one another to form something like a hammock. I spent the night in the arms of those trees, between the earth and sky. The next morning, I was determined to find my way out of the forest, even though my back ached painfully from sleeping in the trees. On my way, I came to a spring that ran from under a gigantic rock. I sat by it to rest, and there I had eye contact with a huge dark snake that had retreated behind the bush. I found a long stick, um, strong stick to protect myself as I sat playing with the leaves on the ground to avoid bringing up thoughts that occupied my mind. But my mind seemed to torment me, and every effort to clear away the terrible thoughts was in vain. So I decided to walk, tapping the ground with the stick I held. I walked all morning and into the evening, but in the end, found myself at the same place where I had slept the previous night. That was when I finally came to accept that I was lost, and it was going to take a while to get out of here. I decided to make my new home a little bit more comfortable by adding leaves to the adding leaves to the weaved branches to make them less hard to sleep on. I walked around to familiar, familiarize myself with my vicinity. I was getting acquainted with my new home. I cleared the dry leaves. Then I took a stick and drew lines in the ground where, from my sleeping place to the spring where I had met my new neighbor, the snake. There was another one drinking water and it became motionless upon seeing me. As I went about my business, I heard it crawling away. I drew lines by parting the dried leaves on the ground. These lines helped me from getting lost in between the spring and my sleeping place. After I finished familiarizing myself with the area, I sat down and tried to think about how I was going to get out of the forest. But that didn't go well, since I was afraid of thinking. I eventually decided that maybe it was better to be where I was. Even though I was lost and lonely, it was safe for the time being. Along the spring, there were several trees with a ripe fruit that I had never seen. Birds came to eat this strange fruit every morning. I decided to try some of it, since it was the only edible thing around. It was, neither, it was either to take the chance and eat this fruit that might poison me, or die from hunger. I decided to eat the fruit. I thought if the birds ate it and lived, maybe I could too. The fruit was shaped like a lemon, with an outer layer of mixed colors of yellow and red. Inside was a crusty, watery, fruity part with a very tiny seed. It smelled like a mixture of ripe mango, orange, and something else that was irresistibly inviting. Hesitantly, I plucked one and took a bite. It didn't taste as good as it smelled, but it was satisfying. I must have had about 12 of them. Afterward, I drank some water and sat, waiting for the result. I thought about when Junior and I had visited Cabrati and would take walks with our grandfather on paths around the coffee farms by the village. He would point out medicinal leaves and trees whose barks were important medicines. During each visit, Grandfather always gave us a special medicine that was supposed to enhance the brain's capacity to absorb and retain knowledge. He made this medicine by writing a special Arabic prayer on a wali, a slate, with ink that was made of another medicine. The writing was then washed off the slate, and that water, which they called Nessie, was put into a bottle. We took it with us, and were supposed to keep it a secret and drink it before we studied for exams. This medicine worked. During my primary school years and part of my secondary school years, I was able to permanently retain everything I had learned. Sometimes it worked so well that during examinations, I could visualize my notes and all that was written on each page of my textbooks. It was as if the books had been imprinted inside my head. This wonder was one many of my childhood. To this day, I have an excellent photographic memory that enables me to remember details of the day-to-day -day moments of my life indelibly. 
I looked around the forest for one of the medicinal leaves that my grandfather had said removed poison from the body. I might need it if the fruit I had eaten was poisonous, but I couldn't find the plant. Nothing happened after a couple of hours, so I decided to take a bath. I hadn't had time to take one for a while. My clothes were dirty, my craps, my shoes were rotten, and my body was sticky with dirt. When I first threw water onto my skin, it became slimy. There was no soap, but in the forest there, of the, um, there was an area that had a particular kind of grass that could be used as a substitute. I had learned about this grass during one of the summers when I had visited my grandmother. When I squeezed a bunch of the grasses together, they provided foam that left my body with a fresh scent. After I finished taking a bath, I washed my clothes, or rather, soaked and spread them on the grass to dry. I sat naked and cleaning my teeth with sapwood. A deer came by and watched me suspiciously before it went about its affairs. I resisted thinking by listening to the sound of the forest as songs of birds collided with the shouting of monkeys and the cackle of baboons. baboons. By evening, my clothes were still damp, so I put them on so that the heat of my body would dry them faster before night fell. I was still alive despite eating the nameless fruit, so I ate some more for dinner. That following morning, I ate some more from breakfast and later for lunch and dinner again. The nameless fruit became my only source of food. The fruit was plentiful, but I knew that sooner or later there would be no more. Sometimes I felt as if the birds gave me angry looks for eating so much of their food. The most difficult part of being in the forest was the loneliness. It became unbearable each day. One thing about being lonesome is that you think too much, especially when there isn't much else you can do. I didn't like this, and I tried to stop myself from thinking, but nothing seemed to work. I decided to just ignore every thought that came into my head because it brought too much sadness. Apart from eating and drinking water and ounce of every other day taking and once every other day taking a bath, I spent most of my time fighting myself mentally in order to avoid thinking about what I had seen and were wondering where my life was going, where my family and friends were. The more I resisted thinking, the longer the days became, and I felt as if my head was becoming heavier each passing day. I became restless and was afraid to sleep for fear that my suppressed thoughts would appear in my dreams. As I searched the forest for more food and to find a way out, I feared coming in contact with wild animals like leopards, lions, and wild pigs. So I stayed closer to trees that I could easily mount to hide myself from these animals. I walked as fast as I could, but the more I walked, the more it seemed I was getting deeper into the thickness of the forest. The harder I tried to get out, the bigger and taller the trees became. This was a problem because it got difficult to find a tree that was easy to climb and had suitable branches to sleep in. One evening, as I searched for a tree with a forked branch to sleep in, I heard grunts. I wasn't exactly sure what animals were producing such noisy grunts, but they became louder. I climbed a tree to be safe. As I sat there, a herd of wild pigs came running. It was the first time I had seen wild pigs, and they were huge, all of them. They stood up. If they stood up, they would all be taller than me. Each one had forked teeth extending out of its mouth. As they passed underneath me, one of the biggest pigs stopped and sniffed the air in all directions. It must have sensed my presence. When they were gone, I climbed down, and all of a sudden, a couple of enormous pigs came running at me. They chased me for about half a mile as I looked for a tree to climb. Fortunately, I found one that I was able to mount in one jump. The pigs stopped and started charging at the bottom of the tree. They grunted loudly, and the rest of the herd came back. They all started charging at the tree and tried to chew the bottom. I climbed higher and higher. After a while, they finally gave up as a cricket started calling for night to commence. My grandmother once told me a story about a notorious hunter of wild pigs who used magic to transform himself into a wild boar. He would then lead the herd into an open area of the forest where he would change back into human form, then trap and shoot the pigs. One day during his trickery, a small pig saw the hunter biting a plant that enabled him to return to his human form. The pig told all its companions what it had seen. The herd searched the forest for the hunter's magic plant and destroyed every single one of them. The next day, the hunter performed his trickery and lured the herd into an opening. But he couldn't find the plant to become human again. The pigs tore him to pieces. Since that day, the wild pigs have distru distrusted all humans, and whenever they see a person in the forest, they think he or she is there to avenge the hunter. So said my grandmother.